Hey everybody, welcome to my channel. As you can see, I'm working in the craft room today, getting everything set up. Trigger warning, we're going to talk about Paul Bernardo and Carla Homolka today while I'm doing some of my vinyl cutting. Yeah, I'm getting all this stuff set up real nice and neat now. Let me tell you something, this shit right here is expensive. I'm having to order it off the internet to get bigger bulks because getting this at Walmart and Michael's is really costly and there's not much to it. Even like the vinyl and stuff, it's just very, very expensive. Anywho, let's get into it. So I'm sure most of you have heard of Paul Bernardo and Carla Homolka. They were two of Canada's most psychotic, evil serial killers and rapists. And again, trigger warning, this is going to be very dark. It's going to be about sexual rape, abuse, physical abuse, domestic violence, everything. So if it triggers you, go ahead and go. You know, it's going to be bad. So, way back. I say way back. I was born in 85. I'm 36. Almost 36. But back in the late 90s, early 90s, late 80s, early 90s, Paul and Carla meet. Now, I'm not going to get all in the detail because you can go to Wikipedia and you can go on YouTube and look up like Stephanie Harlow or Leader One Studio. He has a great video on Paul Bernardo. Leader One Studios. Check them out. So, Paul, Carla, they meet. We're not going to discuss all those details. Eventually, she brings him home to mom and daddy. Everybody likes him. They're like, that's a great guy. That's, you know, he's going to be successful one day. <laughs> you know, Paul was one of these guys that he's very cocky. Very into himself. You know, he thinks he's perfect. He thinks he's the biggest, baddest dude around, you know. Paul wanted to be a rapper. Paul thought he had a, a possible career in rapping. Fortunately, that never happened because, geez, listen. Just just have a listen to this. This is Paul Bernardo, everyone, rapping. Yeah, you did. Actually, you did. Your ass did get caught. <laughs> Could you imagine your spouse or your friend saying, hey, come have a seat and listen to this. This is me rapping. Have a seat. Isn't that great? Don't I sound amazing? I'm going to be the next rapper. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to be like this big, badass rapper, and I'm going to make millions of dollars. If somebody sounded like that and told me they were going to be like the next big rapper, I would have to nicely tell the truth. I'd be like, nah, nah, bro, you really aren't going to be the next rapper. You're not. You suck. You suck. But that's just me. I'm an honest person. I'm blunt. I'm nicely honest. Hey, so, eventually, they move in to Carla's mama and daddy's house. They all live together in Carla's parents' house, along with Carla's little sister, Tammy. Now, this is where the story starts taking a very dark drop. Paul was pissed off because Carla was not a virgin when he first had sex with her. He was very offended by that. He was like, you owe me because you were not a virgin when we met. You had already gave that to someone else. You owe me a virgin. This should have been the moment where Carla was like, and was gone. But she didn't. She didn't do that. She stayed like a little puppy and was like, okay, let me find you a virgin, you know, because I love you so much. What gets me, all these channels who talk about Paul and Carla, always talk about how fine they were, right? They always call them the Ken and Barbie murderers and all this stuff. Paul was not that fine. I've seen pictures and videos of this dude. No, he was not that fine. No, he wasn't. No, he wasn't. Carla, she was a pretty girl. She could have had a, a pick of her choice of, of spouses. I mean, really. You know, Carla wasn't stupid. Carla actually had some schooling, you know, had some good looks, had nice taste in fashion. Carla, again, she could have had her choice of so many partners in life. She chooses Paul. 
I'll never understand why. But Paul moves into her parents' house where he begins his obsession over Carla's little sister, Tammy. Tammy, 14 years old, you know, I think when they started actually dating, she was like 12 or 13. So his obsession had began before he moved in with them, but it got worse when he moved in with them because he's seen Tammy more. Now, every time Carla turned around, Paul was coming at her with the, I want to have sex with your sister. I want to have sex. I want to take your sister's virginity. She's a virgin. She's pure. She's innocent. That should have been the, the biggest, hugest red flag for Carla to be like, um, get the fuck out. The fuck out. Just go. Don't come back. Don't pass go. Don't go to jail. Go. And then she should have reported it to her parents and to the law. You know, the rapes of Scarborough had been going on during this time. That was Paul. Nobody knew, though. The police work in this case, of course, we have another case where police work was just shoddy as hell. At some point, they got Paul's DNA. He gave it to him willingly. He didn't even fight it. He gave it to him. And they put it in a drawer and left it for years where it would sit and just collect dust. So back to Paula, Paul, Carla, and Tammy. They're hanging out. They're spending most every day together. You know, Tammy loves Paul, thinks the world of him, has somewhat like a little, you know, schoolgirl school girl crush on him. Not nothing major, but just like that's her big sister's boyfriend. You know, he's claiming to be this big, successful man and blah, 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 even though he's living with his girlfriend's parents living off his girlfriend's parents because he's smuggling cigarettes for a living. He don't have a job. Paul's too good for a job. You know, he's one of those guys. I don't, I don't, I shouldn't have to work. I'm too good to work. You should have to work and support me because I'm so sexy. He's one of those guys, yeah. I don't know why Carla's parents allowed him to move in. I mean, we can sit here all day and say it was because it was the 90s. It was because they thought a lot of him. It was because he had a good talk game. But again, I still don't understand why. Because they had their slight doubts about Paul from the beginning. You know, they worried about Car uh, Carla. They noticed that Carla was changing within her time of being with him. She was changing, but they allowed him to stay there. I don't know. So Paul would go back and forth between Scarborough and their house. But eventually he stayed there full time. That's terrifying. I bet you Carla's parents t today are just disgusted with the fact that they had him living in their house. Especially from what I'm fixing to tell you happened. So one night. So Carla works at the vet's office. Veterinarian's office. She has access to different drugs, you know, different medicines that they give the animals for different surgeries, like anesthesia, pain medicines, things like that. Look right there. Miss Pris, what are you doing? My little taco, she's growing up, ain't she? I didn't want to interrupt the story, but my little baby's growing up. She's so nosy, I like it. My little rescue baby. Mama's little baby. Hey, lovey. You come to listen to the story, baby. I love you. So, Paul keeps telling Carla, I want to have sex with her. I want to have. I want to take her virginity. We have to do this now. It has to be now. And how are we going to do it? So, him and Carla come up with a plan to drug Tammy. Now, they figure that Carla can steal the medicine from the veterinarian's office, bring it home, they can put it in Tammy's drink, they can put it on a cloth, you know, put it over her face, like chloroform, several different ways they can do it. Now, what they didn't count on was Carla or Paul knowing how much to use. So one evening, Paul goes to Carla and says, today's today. It's the day. We're going to do this. Tonight, I'm going to take her virginity. That's it. Carla was like, no, I don't want to do it tonight. There's, you know, my parents are here. You know, anything can happen. I just, I don't, but she did. So later on that evening, they're hanging out. They're all drinking, you know, in the den, hanging or the basement, hanging out together and stuff. And uh, Tammy asked their parents, can I stay up with Carla and Paul a little longer? I want to hang out with them a little bit longer and have fun tonight. Can I please stay up with them? And 
Tammy's parents tell her, yeah, okay, just for a little while longer. So they sneak her alcohol, and as they're sneaking her little cups of alcohol, they're drugging it. Eventually, Tammy passes out, and that's where um, Paul grabs his video camera, and he and Carla position Tammy in a sexual position, and they begin to fondle her, take her clothes off, continue fondling her to where Paul starts to get so excited he wants to have intercourse. Carla says, get a condom. Get a condom. And he says no, and he inserts himself in her. Does not use a condom. He rapes her vaginally. He rapes her in every way. He and Carla both rape her in every way. That's bad. I know, that's horrible. And it's just vile and evil and disgusting. The guys, it's going to get worse. So, after a few minutes, they have positioned her several different ways. Well, there was one side effect to this drug that Carla didn't realize, and that was nausea and vomiting. So, after some time later, Carla tells Paul, you have to hurry up. I don't want my parents to get up. So, they continue, but... Paul, him and Carla think that Tammy's starting to wake up a little bit, so they put it on a cloth and put it over her face to make her breathe it in. Within a few minutes, Tammy begins to get nauseated and starts to throw up, to vomit. As she's vomiting, the position that she's in, she's choking on her vomit. Paul and Carla realize she's throwing up and they can't get it out, and she isn't breathing at this point. They start to panic start trying to pull her clothes back on and they start screaming and yelling you know and her parents come and 911 ends up getting called Tammy's dead she dies they tell Carla's parents it's because she must have drank too much and vomited you know and choked on her vomit but that is not what happened now remember they videoed this and Paul would keep this videotape for years, for, you know, several years. And what's so horrible, he and Carla both consoled their parents, their friends, their family. They acted like they were just oblivious to what happened. They just acted like she just, she got sick on the alcohol and, you know, it was like that. And he continued to comfort her family and be that loving son-in-law that they wanted <clears throat> what disturbs me so much about this is the fact that after Tammy's death Carla's parents told Carla Paul has to go it's hard enough that we're dealing with the loss of your sister but we just we need we need some time to ourselves right now as a family when they tell Carla that she decides she wants to go with Paul and Paul did not force her to go. She chose to go. This is where a lot of people get this story crossed up and they keep trying to say that Paul forced this and controlled that. And no, Carla went willingly on her own because she wanted to be with him. Now, at this point, you could sit here and say, well, yeah, but he could have blackmailed her for the death of Tammy, but she could have blackmailed him too. They could have blackmailed each other over the death of Tammy. So no, she didn't have to go. She could have easily said, well, if, if you don't go by yourself and let me stay here with my family, I'll tell them what you did. You'll get in just as much trouble. She didn't do that. Neither one of them did that. They left together. They got a place together eventually, and they lived together, and that's where the horrors really started. It got very, very ugly very quick. Now, if you've noticed, I haven't talked about the rapes before he got with Carla and during the beginning of his relationship with Carla because we're going to get to that. So Tammy, Tammy's passed away and they have killed her and nobody knows yet. So after Paul and Carla get their own place and they're set up together on June, and I'm going to read this so I get this right. On June 7th, 1991, Carla, Carla, invited a 15-year-old girl she had befriended at a pet shop two years earlier, known as Jane Doe, for a girl's night out. After an evening of shopping and dining, Carla 
pi- uh, plied Jane Doe with alcohol, laced with a uh, hal- halcyon. I think is how you say it. It's like a anesthesia. Uh, it's like a, what the anesthesiologists use to help you sleep. You know, during a surgery. When the girl lost consciousness, Carla called Paul to tell him that his surprise wedding gift was ready. Bernardo videotaped Carla raping the girl before he himself sexually assaulted her the next morning. The next morning, Jane Doe was nauseated but thought that her vomiting was from drinking too much alcohol for the first time and did not realize that she had been raped. In August, Jane Doe was invited back to the house to spend the night and was again drugged. Carla called 911 for help because the girl had stopped breathing while being raped. Carla called back a few minutes later to say that everything was all right and the ambulance was recalled without a follow-up. And Jane Doe survived. Do you realize this was all Carla? Now, we can sit here and say Paul told her to get him a girl. Paul told her he wanted to be, you know, he wanted her to bring home another girl for him to rape and all that stuff. But Carla did this on her own. We can't keep putting all the blame on Paul in this relationship. We, as a society, have to understand that women can be just as evil as men. And I get so fed up with these other YouTubers and all these other uh, crime stories channels who try to make it out like it's all Paul Bernardo. Yes, while he is evil and it is a lot him, it's also Carla. We can't sit here and exclude her when she was a big part of this. She is a huge part of why these girls died. And the biggest reason... Paul wasn't caught for so long. So, Leslie Mahaffey. Leslie Mahaffey. Early in the morning, June 15th, 1991, Paul Bernardo detoured through Burlington, halfway between Toronto and St. Catharines, to steal license plates that he had found. He eventually had found Leslie Mahaffey, a 14-year-old who had missed her curfew after attending a friend's wake and was locked outside of her house. Paul left his car and approached Mahaffey, saying he wanted to break into a neighbor's house. Unfazed, she asked if he had any cigarettes. When Paul led her to his car, he blindfolded her, first forced her into the car, drove her to Port Deluzi, and informed Carla that he had a victim. Paul and Carla videotaped themselves torturing and raping and sexually abusing Mahaffey while, she listened, while they listened to Bob Marley and David Bowie. At one point, Paul said, you're doing a good job, Leslie, a damn good job, adding, the next two hours are going to determine what I do to you. Right now, you're scoring perfect. On another segment of the tape played at Paul's trial, the assault escalated. Mahaffey cried out in pain and begged Paul to stop. In the crown description of the scene, he was sodomizing her while her hands were bound with twine. Mahaffey later told Paul that, Her blindfold seemed to be slipping, which signaled the possibility that she could identify her attackers if she lived. The following day, Paul claimed Carla fed her a lethal dose of halcyon. Carla claimed that Bernardo strangled her. They put Mahaffey's body in their basement, and the day after Carla's family had dinner at the house. After the Homolkas and their remaining daughter, Lori, left, Bernardo and Homolka decided that the best way to dispose of the evidence would be to dismember Mahaffey and encase each part of her remains in cement. Paul bought a dozen bags of cement at a hardware store. The following day, he kept the receipts, which were damaging at his trial. Bernardo used his grandfather's circular saw to dismember Mahaffey. Paul and Carla made a number of trips to the dump to dump cement blocks in Lake Gibson, 18 kilometers south of Port Deluzi. At, at least one of the blocks weighed 200 pounds and was way beyond their ability to sink. It lay near the shore where it was found by Michael Doucet and his son, Michael Jr., while on a fishing trip on June 29, 1991. Mahaffey's orthodontic appliance was instrumental in identifying her. Carla was released from prison July 4, 2005, several days before Paul was interviewed by police and his lawyer, Tony Bryant. According to Bryant, Bernardo said that he had always intended to free the girls that he and Carla had kidnapped. However, when Mahaffey's blindfold fell off, allowing her to see Bernardo's face, Carla was concerned that Mahaffey would identify Paul and report them to police. Bernardo claimed, Paul claimed that Carla planned to murder Mahaffey by injecting her with an air bubble into her bloodstream, triggering an air embolism. It's so hard 
to sit there and listen to Paul and Carla try to justify why they they killed that child. Well, her blindfold fell off, and, and that was just an inconvenience to us because we didn't want her to name us. Then don't kidnap people. Don't kidnap and rape people because their blindfold could fall off, and then you end up killing them. Don't do that. Leave people alone. Go get some damn help. Don't kidnap people. It's that easy. Then you don't have to worry about nobody. You don't have to worry about jail time if you don't hurt people. Every time I read this story, I feel so bad for Leslie Mahaffey's mother because Leslie Mahaffey's mother had only locked the doors because, you know, she had a teenage child who had been not coming home at curfew, so a way to punish or discipline was to lock the doors. So she would sit outside until the next morning and learn her lesson is basically how her mother seen that. Y'all, that's happened to the best of us. My mom and my dad, they used to do that because I was sneaking out. I was bad for that mess. And when I would sneak out, I weren't doing bad things. I'd be walking down the road, out in the woods, you know, just dumb stuff. But still, I, I knew to have my butt home, but I didn't listen. So they would lock the door, and I would have to sit outside and learn my lesson. It We can't sit here and blame Leslie's mom. That's not her fault. Leslie's mom didn't know a serial rapist was out. You know, they had heard about some of the rapes that had went on, but she didn't know a, a murdering rapist was hanging outside of her house. Of course, she wouldn't have locked her child out there. She had no idea. I have seen so many people on the internet blame Leslie's mom for locking the doors at curfew. But y'all can't blame that woman. She was trying to, to discipline a child. She wasn't trying to hurt her child. She was just trying to teach a lesson of be home on time. It happens to us, you know? I just feel so bad for Leslie's mother. She really just, she don't deserve the hate she's gotten. If you're going to be mad at somebody, be mad at Paul and Carla for being disgusting, evil rapists. Be mad at them. <clears throat> so Christian French. Christian French. 15-year-old girl. During the after-school hours of April the 16th, 1992... But Paul and Carla drove through St. Catharines to look for potential victims. That right there tells you how involved and how invested both of them were. You didn't see Carla staying at home and not being involved at all. You didn't see her calling police. You didn't see her calling her family or his family. She didn't do that. She was in the car with him. You know, looking. She was going into the mall strips to tell other teenage girls, Hey, I got marijuana. I've got this, I've got that. You know, if you'll come help me or you can come to my house and get some alcohol, we'll party all night or I got a cigarette at the car. She was luring him victims. Excuse me. She was luring them victims. It was for them. Because let me tell you something, guys. If you're thinking, well, because he was the man and he was abusive, she was pushed into it and he was just forcing her to do everything. Nah. Because Carla cut a deal. And Carla cut a deal because she basically ratted out Paul. Police gave her a deal. She only got a, just a few little years and she got out. But after they struck that deal, they found the videotapes. And when they found those videotapes, they realized Carla was in way more than she ever told police. She tried to tell police that she was a domestic violence victim. She was a battered wife, and he was forcing her to do all these things. She would have never done them if he hadn't forced her to do it. But the videotapes, they say different. The videotapes show her being very involved, initiating things in the rapes, that she was being pleased. She was having sex with these girls, raping these girls to please herself as well as Paul. Carla is not a victim. Don't get it twisted. So, they, Carla and Paul drove through St. Catharines to look for potential victims. Although most of the students were still going home, the streets were generally empty as they passed Holy Cross Secondary School, a Catholic high school in the city's north end. They spotted 15-year-old Kristen French walking briskly to her nearby home. They pulled into a parking lot nearby Grace Lutheran Church, and Carla 
Carla got out of the car, map in hand, pretending to need directions or assistance. When Kristen French looked at the map, Paul attacked her from behind, brandishing a knife, and they forced her into the front seat of the car. From the back seat, Carla subdued French by pulling her hair. That sounds like Carla is a, a lot involved. Way more involved than what people actually believe or think. Yes, yeah, she was involved a whole ass lot. Carla is the reason he got most of these girls. Tammy, Kristen, Jane Doe, all because of Carla. And yes, Paul did manage to rape on his own before and during with Carla. But Carla is, with these murders, she's mostly connected to the murder victims. Paul actually, as far as we know, as far as we know, did not murder until he was with Carla. That's an inter interesting fact. Hmm. Now, if that changes in the near future, you know, okay. But as of right now, we don't know of Paul killing anyone before Carla, before being with her. So, I don't know. That's, that's interesting to me. Over the Easter weekend, Bernardo, Paul Bernardo, and Carla videotaped themselves torturing, raping, and sodomizing Kristen, forcing her to drink large amounts of alcohol with drugged alcohol and submit to Paul. At his trial, Crown Prosecutor Ray said that Paul always intended to kill her because she was never blindfolded and could identify her captors. The following day, Paul and Carla murdered French before going to Carla's family, uh, family's house for Easter dinner. Carla testified at her trial that Paul, uh, Paul Bernardo strangled Kristen French for seven minutes while she watched. Paul said that Carla beat French with a rubber mallet because she tried to escape. And Kristen French was strangled with a nose, with a noose around her neck while, oh, they wrote that wrong, okay. And Kristen French was strangled with a noose around her neck, which was secured to a hope chest. Carla then went to fix her hair. Kristen French's nude body was found April 30, 1992, in a ditch in Burlington, about 45 minutes from St. Catharines, a short distance from the cemetery where Mahaffey is buried. She had been washed. Her hair had been cut off. Although it was thought that French's hair was removed as a trophy, Carla testified that it was to um, keep her from being identified, basically. But they knew there was dental records. So I don't believe Carla when she says it was to keep her from being identified. That don't make no sense. Fingerprints, teeth. Yeah, Carla is a bit, she's more of a liar than Paul is. And I hope Carla sees this video. And I hope you, you got something to say. Come comment on my YouTube channel, bitch. I hope you do. Yes, guys, if you didn't know, Carla Homolka is out. Free and clear, living on your streets. Yeah, the woman I just read did all this shit is free. She left when she got out of prison, she went to Quebec because they didn't hear a lot about these murders in that area. The media didn't advertise it as much. But as soon as people found out she was in a certain area around a school full of kids, they snapped. They were like, oh, hell no. You can get the hell out of here. Get up out of here. But she's out. Is that not disgusting? After everything I just read you, she helped to rape and torture and murdered her own sister her own little sister, in her parents' basement. Now, Carla was not was not a teenager when this happened. She was a grown woman. Then she rapes and tortures, sodomizes Jane Doe with Paul. Then she helps Paul rape and torture Leslie Mahaffey. Then she helps lure and torture. She lures, uh, Le but then she gets uh, Kristen French and rapes and tortures and sodomizes her with Paul. And then holds her in the front seat by her hair so she can't get away. That is Carla's guilty. Carla is a killer. And bitch, I hope you see this video and I hope you comment. Oh. Ooh. I am no Billy Badass, but when it comes to this, how, why would they let her go? She is a killer. I just can't get over that. Oh my gosh. I done spilled this stuff all over me. Okay. So, Carla and Bernardo were questioned by police several times in connection to the Scarborough Rapist investigation. 
And that's, that's where it really blows my mind because Paul Bernardo had been submitted DNA and they just hadn't ran it. It sat in a damn fridge or a drawer or wherever it sat. And they had it the whole time. For like, I think a good two years, I believe they had it. Maybe, no, maybe it was from, anyways. So they got questioned on Tammy's death. They got questioned about uh, Paul stalking other women before the death of Kristen French. You know, because Paul had been seen a couple of times luring around windows and shit. The officer filed a report May 12th, 1992, um, an NRP sergeant and constable briefly interviewed Paul Bernardo. The officers decided that he was an unlikely suspect, although Paul Bernardo admitted he had been questioned in connection to the Scarborough rapes. How do you figure he's, he's just an unlikely suspect when he told you, yeah, I've been questioned about Scarborough rapes too? That's when the police should have been like, you have? Well, come here and let's talk some more. And... Run the DNA. I mean, geez. Three days later, the Green Ribbon Task Force was created to investigate the murders of Mahaffey and French. Paul and Carla had applied to have their names legally changed to Till, um, which Paul Bernardo had taken from the serial killer in the 1998 film Criminal Law. At the end of May, John Moult, an acquaintance of Bernardo, reported that Paul Bernardo as a possible suspect. Told police... This could be your dude. This could be your guy. Investigate this dude. <clears throat> so six months after Paul submitted a DNA sample, okay, well that explains that part. Uh, six months after he submitted a DNA sample, Toronto police were informed that it matched the Scarborough rapist and immediately placed him under 24-hour surveillance. Metro Toronto Sexual Assault Squad investigators interviewed Carla on February 9, 1993. Despite hearing their suspicions about Paul, Carla focused on his abuse on her. And that's where they fucked up, guys. That's where the police department fucked up. Because they allowed her to play the battered wife card because he did beat her the day before she actually confessed to everything. Well, a couple of days before, he hit her with a flashlight, he had choked her, he had, you know, punched her in the face, he beat her. From what she says, now all we know is that she did have two black eyes, but he did put his hands on her. And he admitted he did, because he made her an audio apologizing, saying that he had hit himself in the face with a flashlight, and he's seen how bad it hurt, and he was sorry. That kind of narcissist, yeah. And no, he did not have a black eye. He did not hit himself with a flashlight, he's stupid. But all she focused on was how he abused her. Later that night, she told her aunt and uncle that Paul was the Scarborough rapist. Could you imagine? Could you imagine being Carla's aunt and uncle and her looking at you? Imagine your niece looking at you and being like, well, my husband's a Scarborough rapist. And But you know what she did. She lied. And she said, I didn't have nothing to do with it. He did all of it. I just, I was beaten into submission. I didn't, mm -mm. he forced me to do everything. No, we, we got the videotapes. We know what happened. And she did have a lot to do with it. And she did lure those girls. She did rape, sodomize, drug, and, and murder these girls. Unfortunately, police wanted Paul so bad that they, they busted a deal with her to get him. And that's what sucks, is they should have got both of them. Especially with this kind of evidence, the DNA evidence. And her sister being dead. I just can't believe this shit. So, she told him that he was the Scarborough rapist. And, let's see. Okay, and that she and Paul were involved in the rape and murder of Leslie Mahaffey and Christian French. And that the rapes were recorded on videotape. The NRP reopened its investigation of Tammy Homolka's death. Two days later, Carla met with Niagara Falls lawyer George Walker, who sought legal immunity from... That's what gets me. Sought legal immunity in exchange for her cooperation, and she was placed under 24-hour surveillance. The couple's name was approved. The couple's name change was approved on February 13, 93. The next day, Walker met with Crown Criminal Law Office Director Murray uh, Siegel after Walker told Siegel about the videotapes and the rapes. Siegel advised him, due to Carla's involvement in the crimes, full immunity was not a possibility. On February 17th, Metro Sexual Assault Squad and Green Ribbon Task Force detectives arrested Paul on several charges and obtained a search warrant. 
Because his link to the murders was weak, the warrant was limited. No evidence which was expected and documented in the warrant could be removed from the premises. And all videotapes found by police had to be viewed in the house. Damage had to be kept at a minimum. Police could not tear down the walls looking for the videotapes. The search of the house, including updated warrants, lasted 71 days and only one tape. And the only tape was found by police had a brief segment of Carla performing oral sex on the Jane Doe. Because Paul had put those tapes somewhere. That's what was so messed up. I believe he had given them to his lawyer and his piece of shit lawyer held them until after a certain time. And that's what's so messed up is Paul still got life. He'll never get out. He keeps trying, but he won't get out. But the fact that if the lawyer had have released the tapes, they could have gotten Carla too. But he held the tapes. Idiot. Makes me so mad. Okay. Paul was tried for the murders of French and Mahaffey in 1995. His trial included detailed testimony from Carla and the videotapes of the rapes. Paul testified that the deaths were accidental, later claiming that his wife was the actual killer. Imagine if that's true. And she's out here walking the damn streets, but I still say they both are the killers and they both are guilty. On September 1st of 1995, Paul was convicted of a number of offenses, including the two first-degree murders and two aggravated sexual assaults, and sentenced to life in prison without parole for at least 25 years. He was designated a dangerous offender, making him unlikely to ever be released. How would he even get considered parole after 25 years? He's a killer. Change those laws, people. Please change them. We don't want these people back out on our streets. We don't want Carla on our streets right now. In a plea bargain, a 12-year sentence for manslaughter. Huh, yeah. Carla testified against Paul in the murder trial. The plea bargain was criticized by many Canadians since Paul's first defense lawyer, Ken Murray, withheld the videotapes for 17 months. They were considered crucial evidence, and prosecutors said that they would never have agreed to a plea bargain if they had seen the tapes. Murray was later acquitted of obstruction of justice and faced a disciplinary hearing by the Law Society of Upper Canada. So, yeah, he held the tapes for 17 months. And like the police, the detective said, we would have never made a plea deal with her if we had have seen those tapes. Because what? Because of what? She was on the tapes raping the girls just like he was and enjoying it. She did not look like no abuse victim who was being forced into raping these girls. She was enjoying herself. She was doing things that really showed that she was enjoying being in that situation. She enjoyed the control. She enjoyed abusing and torturing these girls. And I think that she was jealous of what Paul, him wanting other women. And I think she took that frustration out on those girls. I really believe that. I think that's why she, with her sister, because Paul always talked about how he wanted her sister, how he wanted Carla to be like her sister, how her, you know, her sister was a virgin and she would never be that or be able to give him that. And I think Carla took that out on her sister and that was not her sister's fault. That's your fault for dating a, a nasty, disgusting pedophile rapist. That's your fault. You should have broken up with him as soon as you've seen the red flag. And if, guys, if she had no red flags before, you know, before he wanted her sister, as soon as he said, I want your sister, that was your red flag. There's no excuse. There was always a red flag in this situation that Carla could have walked away and gotten out of this. There was always one. And I believe Paul told her a lot more about the Scarborough rapes than what she's leading on and what he's leading on. I think he told her about every bit of it. You know, because she obviously told her family. So, Paul, uh, although Bernardo was kept in a segregation unit at Kinston Penitentiary for his own safety, he was attacked and harassed. He was punched in the face by another inmate when he returned from the shower in 96. In June 1999, five convicts tried to storm his segregation range and riot and a riot squad had to gas to disperse them. I mean, I can't... You know what I'm saying? We're protecting someone who killed our people. We're protecting a, a man who raped and tortured and sodomized a, a, a teenage girl who was 14 and a 15-year-old. And 
he did this to many, not just these three women I'm talking about. We're fixing to get into the rapes, the Scarborough rapist. We're about to get into that. And that's, if you think that these three murders are bad, and they are. I'm not saying they're not. They are very bad. But when I read you this list of rapes, you're really going to see how horrible and how long this goes. And why Paul Bernardo should never be released. <clears throat> So, in 2006, Paul Bernardo gave a prison interview suggesting that he had reformed and would make a good parolee. Um, he would make a good parole candidate. And if they let him out, they're jack shit crazy. That's all I know to tell him. He became eligible to uh, petition a jury. I sounded like I was beatboxing. I was like... Da -da -da -da. <laughs> he become eligible to petition a jury to be allowed to apply for early parole in 2008 under the faint hope clause since he committed multiple murders before the 1997 criminal code amendment, but did not do so. In 2015, Paul became eligible and applied for a day parole in Toronto. According to the victim's lawyer, Tim Danson, it is unlikely that Bernardo will ever be released from prison because of his dangerous offender status. Now, in 2013, he was moved from Kinston to Millhaven Institute in Bath, Ontario, where he is reportedly segregated from the other inmates. Now, Paul Bernardo scored a 35 out of a 40 on the psychopathy uh, checklist, a psychological assessment tool used to assess the presence of psychopathy in individuals. Let me tell you something, guys. When it comes to these tests, you can't sit here and say, he scored a 35 out of a 40. First off, Paul Bernardo was a damn good liar. He can lie on his answers. He can fake in his answers. He can tell you it's worse than what it actually is, or he cannot tell you it's as worse than it actually is. He can sit here and say, I like to beat, abuse, or he can say, no, I didn't like to do this or do that. These tests cannot determine how bad somebody really, really is. And Paul Bernardo is a very, very bad guy. I don't care what he scored. He cannot be released back onto our streets. And I'm going to read you about his parole. Well, he actually, he was applying for a day parole. And he doesn't even need to get a day out. You killed three children. You raped many others. You, can't, you don't need to get out. And that's why I'm doing this video. Because Paul keeps applying. And thinks that he deserves some kind of sympathy. Where was Tammy Sympathy? Where was Leslie Sympathy? Where was Christians? Where was all the women that you beat and choked and raped? Where was their sympathy? Because you damn sure didn't give them none, and Carla didn't give them none either. <clears throat> Carla, I just don't know why her family would even help her. Why would you help your child when you know they did these things? You can only play the domestic violence card so long before we start to see that you're lying. You can only play the battered wife card till we see that you're lying. Yes, while Paul did attack her before the, you know, right before that she confessed, right before that happened, he did attack her and he did physically beat her. But there was a time in their relationship where she admitted that she beat him and she physically hit him and punched him and he didn't hit her back. So they both had a back and forth, physically abusive relationship off and on. But they mainly would come together and abuse other people. So they both deserved life. The fact that she did that to her sister, I just, and these other two women. But let's go up to the list I'm going to read you, okay? The Scarborough, the Scarborough rapist cases, okay? Listen. This just, it, it gets, it started off bad with the rapes and it just got on worse to the, 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 you know, assaults, the rape, the sodomy, the murders. I wonder if Paul started murdering women once he got with Carla, did he and Carla murder these women? Did Carla murder them? You know, we don't know. All we know is that we have this list that I'm fixing to read out of what happened before he got with Carla that he admits to. May 4th, 87. Rape of a 21-year-old Scarborough woman in front of her parents' house after Paul followed her home. Paul had a addiction to being a peeping Tom, and he would sit in the window 
like, and he would stare at girls undressing, and he used to do it to Carla's little sister, and Carla did it too, and they would watch Tammy undress, and Paul would masturbate on her pillow, her bedding, her, you know, different things in her room where she slept at, basically, and Carla knew it. Carla and him had sex in Tammy's bed, in Tammy's floor, on Tammy's clothes. They had sex all over Tammy's room because they wanted to have sex with Tammy. And Carla did too. So that he raped a 21-year-old from Scarborough in front of her parents' home. Um, that was May the 4th. On May the 14th, he raped a 19-year-old woman in the backyard of her parents' house. July 17th, attempted rape of a young woman, although he beat the victim, he abandoned the attack when she fought back. September 29th, he attempted to rape a 15-year-old girl. Paul broke into a house in Scarborough, entered the victim's bedroom. He jumped on her back, put his hands over her mouth, threatened her with a knife, bruised the side of her face, and bit her ear. He fled when the victim's mother entered the room and screamed, 19 years old at that time of the crime. Anthony Hainmeyer was convicted of the sexual assault in 1989 and served a 16-month prison sentence, but was exonerated after Paul admitted to the crime in 2006. <sighs> Another man served time for that. He wasn't even, the, he didn't even do it. Again, you'll have to go back to my other video about falsely accused and being falsely imprisoned. That's another case of it. So, Paul admitted to the crime in 2006. Well, December 16th, he raped a 15-year-old girl. The next day, Metropolitan Toronto Police issued a warning to women in Scarborough traveling alone at night, especially those riding the bus. December 23rd. Now, that was the 16th that he raped a 15-year-old girl. Days later, on the 23rd, on December 23rd, the day before Christmas Eve, he raped a 17-year-old girl with a knife. He used to threaten his victims. At this point, he began to be known as a Scarborough rapist. April 18th. Now, he claims he skipped some time there, but I don't... I think that's when he moved or whenever he was gone on a vacation or he's lying because I don't think he just stopped raping women for months. You know, whether he started dating pa Carla or not, I don't believe because he still kept raping women when he dated Carla. I don't believe for one second he just quit from December to April. I don't believe that. So, April 18th, Paul attacked a 17-year-old girl, May 25th, 1988. Paul was nearly caught by a uniformed Metro Toronto investigator staking out a bus shelter, although the investigator noticed Paul Bernardo hiding under a tree and pursued him on foot. Bernardo escaped. May 30th, rape of an 18-year-old woman in Ontario about four, uh, 25 miles southwest of Scarborough. October the 4th, attempted rape in Scarborough, although his intended victim fought him off he inflicted two stab wounds to her inner thigh and buttock, which required 12 stitches. November the 16th, rape of an 18-year-old woman in the backyard of her parents' house. November the 17th, Metro Police formed a task force. December 27th, attempted a rape with a neighbor chasing Paul off. June the 20th, attempted rape, the young woman fought off and her screams alerted neighbors. Paul fled with the scratches on his face. August 15th, he raped a 22-year-old woman. November 21st, he raped a 15-year-old girl. December 22nd, he raped a 19-year-old woman. May 26, 1990, he raped a 19-year-old woman. Uh, July 1990. July 1990, two months after police received tips that Paul Bernardo resembled a Scarborough rapist composite, he was interviewed by police detectives. Listen, from May... To September of 1990, police submitted more than 130 samples from 130 suspects for DNA testing. Why did they not do polls? I don't know. They said they had a lot of people. Maybe they just didn't get around to it. Maybe they were slacking. They were probably slacking until they finally brought the task force in and started jumping on the case. But did you just hear how long that list was? And that's just what he admits to, okay? That is a list from May 4th to July 1990. May 4th, 1987. Okay. May 4th, 1987. July 1990. That he admits to raping and attacking and beating. Do you think for one second that he's just stopped? You think for one second that those cravings, 
that urge that he has, that darkness has just went away? No, it has not. And even though he's about 55, 56 years old, that don't mean he can't do it again. He can do it again. We've seen people rape, beat, abuse, molest, right on up into their 80s. Yes, he can. And he does not need to be released by no means. If you... Now, let's, let's remember now, from May 4th, 1987 to July of 1990, he raped, beat, sodomized, raped anally. He raped in every way. Went was peeping Tom, going into people's houses. Then he ends up killing Carla's sister. Then Leslie Mahaffey, then Christian French, and possibly another woman they're looking into now. That is not someone who's just going to stop reoffending. That's someone who's going to keep reoffending. And if you don't want him on your streets, you better start getting a petition up, talking to Canada, talking to somebody in that area of where the prison where he's at. You better start talking to the courts because if they let that man out, it's going to be a bad day in hell when he's, I'm telling you, no parole board will be able to keep up with him. The parole board can barely keep up with basic people who get out of prison. I've got a friend right now got out of prison last year, okay? They've called him one time. He was in prison for manslaughter. He goes to the local church. He has gotten a job. They're supposed to call him every month, do a drug test. Like, he's got a whole list of stuff he's supposed to do um, that is his case that he's supposed to do. They've called him one time. I know I've got several of my friends who have went to court because they were raped, and they're rapist got out of prison, and was supposed to be registered as a sex offender. They were supposed to be staying away from churches, schools, daycares, college, things like that. They don't even know where the rapist is. They never call the victim to let the victim know where the rapist is. They don't even call the, 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 the criminal, the rapist, to say, hey, do you have a job yet? Are you, what area? Have you registered as a sex offender? The Carolinas, they don't keep up with that stuff. They are so irresponsible and neglectful when it comes to that. I'm not saying everybody who gets out of prison is bad like that, but I'm saying the really bad ones, they don't keep up with. They don't see them again until if they reoffend and they go back to prison. My best friend, her rapist, we have seen him up and down this road. He is out and about. We've seen him at school. He's dating a woman with two little girls right now. We have warned her. She don't listen. She, my best friend has called his parole officer, his probation officer, whatever. They've done nothing. They said, well, he registered as a sex offender. Yeah, but he's not supposed to be living or being around any children. We'll check into it. They have not checked into it. I can promise you we've called DSS. Social services, we've reported to CPS that this woman is with a sex offender with him living in her home with two small children. Guess what? CPS goes out. They haven't taken the kids. They've barely done anything due to COVID. Due to COVID, they're going to let two children live in a home with a registered sex offender who raped my friend for from the time she was nine years old till she was 13. That's the Carolinas system for you take that in you know you wonder why we're so mad out here you wonder why we get so upset and why we do these videos and why we go off that's why I have I look at my best friend every day well the, day, the days when I get to see her I talk to her on the phone this woman is so strong and so brave but she had something stolen from her that she'll never get back She'll never get that back. No matter how much therapy she gets. No matter how much I tell her I love her. No matter how much I'm there for her. Even when he was in prison, it still didn't make her feel safe at night. I didn't feel safe, you know. Even when they first arrested him, she was terrified because they let him out of jail. Yeah, he was arrested. And then they let him right back out on bail. Bond, whatever. He gets back out. He starts trying to contact her mother and making threats. Eventually, they go to court. He gets sentenced. He gets 16... No, um, excuse me. He don't even get a year. 
He stays in the county jail for about three months, then goes to the prison, gets out on early release, good behavior, and we see him at the store. And he's with another woman who has two small children. After he raped my friend from nine years old to 13, called parole officer, they're not doing shit. They're supposed to. Call CPS. Well, due to COVID, we can't do this, we can't do that. We don't have nowhere to take children, blah, blah, blah. Get the dude out of the house. Make the mom understand that a registered sex offender cannot live with her children. Go re uh, Is he not violating something? He's a registered sex offender. He's not supposed to be living with children. Parole officer says, oh, yeah, that's a violation. Um, let me talk to him. They've yet to do anything. So, guess what? She calls the sheriff's department. She tells them he is a registered sex offender. They have to find out. Let us talk to the parole officer. Let us make sure that he is an actual sex offender. She said, you can pull it up on the internet. Go to his house. That's him. That's his picture. They go. They see it. They call the parole officer. Then the parole officer says, what? I didn't know that he was there. Yes, you did. We told you. We called and left you 100 voicemails. We told you on the phone. We even went, we stalked you and told you. And what you told us was that, well, there's nothing really we can do right now because of COVID, blah, blah, blah. So you're going to let kids get molested because of COVID, right? No. It just, our system is failing our kids every day. More and more and more. Our children are being punished because our system is shit. Especially in states like the Carolinas. It's crap. I want to start doing these longer videos because I have a lot of subs who tell me they, they listen to my videos while they're working. So I hope this was long enough for you. And I'm going to head out of here. And I hope you enjoyed it. And thanks for watching, y'all. Bye.